The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Summer blockbusters, art house favorites. The silver screen has something for everyone. So grab your popcorn. We're going to the movies this week with Canadian Screen Award winning director Clement Virgo, film critic and festival programmer Cameron Bailey, film critic Tom Ernst, and producer Alicia Fletcher. Tonight, superheroes, reboots, and everything in between. That's next on the agenda in the summer. I think if you're a film nerd, we were just nerding out a bit talking about DC or Marvel movies, mm. basically like superhero movies. Right. Superhero movies uh, do very, very well mm -hmm. at the box office. Can we still call it a box office? I think there's yeah, still a box sure. office, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Yeah. And they do better than smaller independent films. Um, are there movies that we miss out on because we don't get to see them at the theater? Uh, Cameron, I'll start with you. So many movies, yes. Yeah. I mean, every year at our festival, we show around 200 feature films, maybe... I don't know. A fifth of those might get into commercial release in movie theaters afterwards. Four fifths of them will never be seen in movie theaters. They go elsewhere. They just never get distribution in North America, anyhow. So, are movies just a money making venture? It's a or? funny, you know, it's a funny business, and uh, long may it live because. It's not, you don't go into it to make money necessarily. Like a tiny sliver of the movies that are made around the world every year actually turn a profit. Mm -hmm. People invest in them for lots of different reasons. Sometimes it's just vanity, right? <laughs> they want to be associated. They want to see their name up on screen as a producer or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. They want to invest in movies. They want to get close to movie stars. They feel like it's just a fun thing to do and they're rich and they can afford to do it. Or it's a hedge fund and they're mm -hmm. just trying to do something with their money because it's better to put it somewhere rather than hold on to it for tax reasons. It could be all different kinds of reasons. There's a long period in Canada where tax advantages is what got movies made, right? The tax shelter films, they're called. Mm -hmm. So it's a strange business. It's not rational like many businesses, mm -hmm. <laughs> but what, what it produces is remarkable because those tax shelter movies produces some enduring Canadian classics, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's a funny thing. It's not always about money, but you need money to do it. Mm, Tom? Uh, I, I find that uh, with so many platforms now that the opportunity to see some of these films that fallen under the radar, that there there is a chance to see them, but you sort of have to sift through mm. a, uh, in order for them to be discovered. Mm. What about you, Alicia? What do you think? It's interesting. There's a couple examples of films that were released on streaming first, especially in the horror genre, that then did remarkably well, became very big on Twitter and in social media, and then they hit theaters. Can you give us an example? Yeah. Uh, there's a horror film. Was it Smile? Or what was the one? Oh, Skin Smile. Smile and Skin, uh, Skin Marink? Skin Marink. Yeah, Canadian that's Marink. a great example. Yeah. Canadian mm -hmm. film. I don't believe it had a theatrical, a major theatrical release. Small, yeah. Very small got a lot of word of mouth, and then mm -hmm. a lot of independent theaters around Canada started showing it and selling it out mm -hmm. because there was so much word of mouth, and it's a horror film, and you want to experience that communally. So there's a kind of that reverse engineering. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. There's it, It's interesting with box office because I'm not sure how it's calculated anymore. You, mm -hmm. There's the domestic box office or North American, but then it does seem like mostly the overseas box office can really determine whether a film is successful or not. Right. And it gets really complicated when you're trying to look at the different layers of money and what that all adds up to, at least for me. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, in terms of um, you know, box office, yes, yes, there's a box office, but then there is the 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 word of mouth. Because a film could die at the box office, and then you have a film like, say, I don't know, Barbara the Barbara Duke, where mm -hmm. it's like it, you know, maybe it takes two years, but suddenly mm -hmm. people to tell their friends and someone tells someone else and suddenly a film that was small that no one saw at a small film festival is now, you know, a film that everyone wants to see. So what's great about the streaming services is that filmmakers, even though their film may not have, may not have had a life in the theaters, mm -hmm. that if you've made a film that is, is, is good and is solid, it will find a life because people will talk about it and share it. Uh, as a director, if DC or Marvel called you and said, hey, we want you to direct this franchise film, would you do it? Yeah, you know, because I, you know, I've, I've done, I've done a version of that, 
but uh, smaller in, the, in in television. You know, we were talking about The Wire earlier. I've done that where someone saw my film, uh, and David Simon saw my film, Rude, and then invited me to do do The Wire. So you did two episodes, right? I, I did two episodes of it. And so, you know, it's I, I, I equate directing those kinds of films the same way TV directors direct TV, because it's it's really a job for hire. And if someone wants to hire me to do a Marvel film or a DC film, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would do it in a second. We talked a little bit about uh, the audience maybe being fickle. Um, as someone, <laughs> I'll put it on the table, I mm -hmm. love Marvel and DC. I like th the comic book hero movies. Mm -hmm. um, is there value in this? Or do you f sometimes feel as if people in the movie <laughs> industry kind of like, oh, it's a Marvel movie? No, and, and I don't think whether it's Marvel or DC or any kind of genre or franchise movies that we can look down on these things. Let's remember that genre is something that is just essential to storytelling, mm -hmm. whether it's you know Greek theater or you know traditional African storytelling. You wanna know what kind of story you're about to experience and knowing what kind of story you're gonna experience is part of the pleasure of it because you know what's coming, you know the arc of it. You see two people who seem totally ill-suited for each other at the beginning of a rom-com, and that's fun because you know they're, they're going to end up together. together. <laughs> right, exactly. <And laughs> well, that, after they go through some challenges. Yeah, and that yeah. journey is part of what you expect. Yeah. You know, you see somebody, you know, with their friends walking through the woods in a horror movie, and you know what's coming. They're not just going to go camping, right? right. right. So the, the pleasure of genre is why we return to it time and time again. Mm -hmm. Marvel's just doing that on a much, much bigger stage with a whole lot of money. Yeah. But it's the same thing. These are characters we know so that when we see Thor's hammer you know and somebody else picks it up mm. or Captain America's shield you know we know because all the expectation from years of comic books and other movies feed into that moment of pure pleasure yeah yeah I mean yeah I mean I love those I love that cinema but I mean Martin you know what Martin Scorsese said about that mm -hmm. cinema right what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's not a fan. Tom, Tom, no, no, please. No, 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 go ahead, Tom. No, 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 he, he does not approve uh, of, of, of uh, those films. I, I don't know exa his exact quote, quote, so that's why I was going to Well, well to I you. think his, his quote was, they're closer to uh, theme parks mm -hmm. than they are to cinema. Do you agree? Well, I don't agree, mm -hmm. you know, because I think, I, think I think cinema has always encompass a big tent. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have your spectacles, you have your small films, you have your comedies, you have your horror, you have your action adventure, you have your love stories. Cinema has always lived under a big tent of all those different genres. And and the spectacle action film has always been a part of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Tom? Well, if you've at, at, asked me, like, Four episodes ago, oh, and this was our first discussion. I would be agreeing with you guys 100%. Now I feel comfortable to say no. Uh, <laughs> it's a right. safe space, Paul. It's a safe space. For <laughs> no, I mean, it was funny. You, uh, Cameron start off to say we, we, we can't look down on the, the Marvel mm -hmm. genre of films. And, I, you know, you've, you're right. But uh, at the same time, <laughs> I don't necessarily have to uh, uh, get excited about them, which no. I don't. Mm -hmm. And, um, the only time I tend to enjoy a Marvel film, which would have been the Scarlett Johansson one, and I'm so out of the universe that I can't remember. Well, I think Widow, Black Widow, I think. Yeah, Black Widow. Widow. Yeah. yeah, the I Black Widow. I think she's in a lot of them, though. Right? <laughs> she is. She, I, she, she gets this killed. Her one. Yeah. Her, <laughs> <Sorry>. the <laughs> Scarlett Johansson <laughs> <laughs> one. Yeah. 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 That I like because it, got, it became a bit meta, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know they started to joke about uh, what the position that women, women superheroes are allowed to land in, you know, and and the way I liked that because it seemed to not take the genre too serious. I, it's a bit off track, I suppose, but I just find this whole Marvel universe um, too intense. You need a degree to sort of follow what's going on mm -hmm. with these people, and I think it's. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think you could have said the same thing if you dropped into 1950s westerns and you're watching a story about Wyatt Earp and Billy the Kid and you'd never heard of these characters before. Mm -hmm. They're also a little bit baffling. You need to know mm -hmm. who these characters are. And you know that from watching tons of other movies and reading mm -hmm. tons of mm -hmm. other stories about the same characters. Mm -hmm. So the Marvel Universe d does demand a lot of previous knowledge. But that's kind of, that's the soup we're living in, you know? Mm -hmm. we, yeah. Everything we watch depends on what we already know mm. going I'm, in. I'm scared to not see one because then I will, you know, it's like 
use it or lose it, yeah. essentially. I feel like if I stop for a year, then I won't be able to come back to Can't it. So I, mm -hmm. I try to keep up, not mm -hmm. with all of them, but with the ones that appeal to me, just because I do think they're part of the conversation. I don't think they're problematic at all. It might just be how the studios position them and the distributors in that they're pushing out other mm -hmm. films for theater space. Yes. But inherently, they're quite well made and they're constantly pushing new technologies. And we do have some of the best filmmakers in the world mm -hmm. making them. You brought up Taika Waititi mm -hmm. and Chloe Zhao, um, Patty Jenkins. Like, this is an impressive roster. Ryan Coogler. Yeah. You know? Yes, of course. And thinking about just saying, no, they're bad. This is the end of cinema. Mm -hmm. I just don't think we can. I'm not <laughs> yeah, saying yeah, that yeah. is what you're saying. <laughs> it's but how but dominant they yeah. are. Yeah. I think yeah. an yeah. issue. You know? yeah. 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 yeah, but you know, also, too, when I was 18, 19, if those films were coming out, I, you know, when when Star Wars came out, for me as a teenager, I loved it. Mm -hmm. You know, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi. We could not wait. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, um, so I, I, you know, I see this generation, and if they, you know, if you're 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, and suddenly there's a new Marvel film, yeah. you'd salivate over that. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not as excited about that. If a George, if a new George Miller a film is coming out, mm -hmm. that's yeah. when I get Which excited. Which it will be, yeah. we should mm -hmm. get excited. But you know, one interesting thing about the Marvel or superhero genre movies is if you imagine that same model, the business model essentially, applied to other movies that we love. Mm -hmm. Like Godfather had one, two, and three. Many of us don't like the three, but watch it again. It's not as bad as you might <laughs> yeah. remember. Yeah. But imagine if all of the characters in The Godfather got their own spin-offs, the one that mm -hmm. survived, you know? And it just expanded in the way that the, the MCU did. Then I think it's a, it's, it's a different way of seeing what Marvel is trying to do. Right? They, Longevity, maybe? Yeah, also, yeah. we know we love these characters. We're invested in them already, so they want to give us more of that, and mm -hmm. they know we'll pay for it, right? Yeah. And I would love to see, you know, Mean Streets 2, 3, and 4. <laughs> <laughs> you know, imagine that. Do you? Imagine <laughs> that. Imagine well, that. speaking of longevity, too, because we seem to be living in a time when um, we're, there's a lot of remakes, a lot of reboots, and I don't know how I feel about some of it. Um, how do you feel about movies from, like, the 90s, the 80s being remade? Hmm. I have no problem with that. I, you know, I think that uh, sometimes there's certain films that deserve to be remade. I, I, uh, and then there's, there's sometimes we confuse a movie uh, thinking it was remade when in fact actually they're just taking the novel that the, that the original story came from and then, you know, doing the film from that. It's not actually a remake, same title, but it's not actually, hmm. I think... Um, uh, Boston Strangler uh, mm. recently uh, did that, and I think to great effect. Um, I think it's better than the one that Tony Curtis did or Rod Steiger and in the other versions of that. So I do think that there is room for remakes. I don't think we necessarily have to uh, scoff and say, well, they already did it and it was and it was great the first time, sure. And that movie still exists. Yeah, and, and that's the thing that I'm concerned about is there is, I think, a, a a generation or an approach to movies where people think that movies are just always getting better and better and better. And the current movies are always the best ones. Mm. And the ones that were made 20, 30 years ago aren't as good, they're not as sophisticated, they're not as well made. And that's just not true in the mm -hmm. same way that you know, an old painting is not worse than a new painting, right? You wouldn't ever think of other art forms the same way. But because people, the older it is, it actually has more value, uh, Yes, right? people somehow think of movies often because they're so technologically based mm -hmm. as getting better every time there's new technology. And that's just not, not the case. case. That's not all. how no. storytelling works. That's it's not right. the technology that makes it a good movie. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, like, remakes have always been a part of cinema. I mean, um, A Star is Born has been made four times now. Mm -hmm. And then you know? tons of other films that are basically that story. Yeah, they just don't call it yeah. A Star is Born. Yeah. Even music yeah. videos. You know, so, so, so like remakes have, have, have always been a part of cinema. Which one of, the, which one of those films are the best? I would say the Judy, the, uh, the Judy Garland one is probably the best mm. one. That's a the good Star one. Is one. Yeah. Mm. I like the Janet Gaynor, though. Yes. <laughs> we'll get into that later. What about the Lady Gaga one? I liked that one a lot. Yeah, that's true. It's actually, the Lady Gaga one was my but favorite. It's, if you, yeah. you know, for a remake for me, it, or a reboot, it just has to be, are you doing something different? Mm. Are you advancing? Or is this just a cash grab? And I think audiences know when it's a cash grab versus this is a filmmaker and a crew engaging with older IP because they love it. Look at The Addams Family. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting case where that's a, a cartoon from The New Yorker that gets translated to TV. It gets translated to a 90s film starring mm -hmm. Raul Julia and mm -hmm. Jellica Houston. Mm -hmm. it's, that was my generation's Addams Family. And now we have The Wednesday Addams Show, mm -hmm. plus a bunch of animated editions. 
it's all good and it just speaks to different, I think different audiences. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Too, right? yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe what you're asking about is really IP, right? Because there aren't a lot of original ideas. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's, it's rare to go to the film, to, to, you know, to the cinema and see something completely fresh and new that's going to be a, a, a brand new franchise. What's IP? Intellectual, Intellectual property. Yeah. Yes, and, and so and so that's a challenge. And for me as a filmmaker now, um, I'm much more conscious of if I'm going to make a film, is there an IP attached to this film? Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I made Brother because I read the book, I loved it, mm -hmm. and Brother was a you know a known quantity. People knew about it. I made the book of Negroes. It was a very similar thing. I loved it, but it was an IP that was recognizable. And so, mm -hmm. filmmakers now have to figure out: Can I create something that's completely original and new, or do I go out and find something that's already exists in the world? I'm glad you brought that up because um, we have uh, a clip with uh, Pia Chattopadhyay, who used to host the summer uh, uh, the agenda on TVO, and this is back in 2015, talking about the alliance between books and film with Kazuo Ishiguro. Let's take a look. It seems to me storytelling, based on based on often on books, sometimes nonfiction books. Um, that that with that very powerful alliance with with cinema, I I, I think it's still dominant. Mm -hmm. I, and and whenever we think of you know what are the dominant things culturally that we've had, I mean, often it's that is to do with that alliance of the the, the the novel that's turned into a movie and everyone's reading the novel as well. Um, Clement, I'll start with you. Do you agree with him? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know. Um, my last two big projects were were based on books. The um, Book of Negroes by Lawrence Hill, uh, which was a very celebrated novel here in Canada, and and also Brother by David Charity, um, another another novel. And so, um, I, for me as a filmmaker, I'm always trying to find whether it's a comic book or a novel or a graphic novel or you know a song or whatever it may be something that could help the audience recognize that this is a this is something that, that they know and and they have a sense of what they're going to buy into um, i want to get Can I just ask, yeah. is the storytelling different when you have an existing piece of ip a novel or a graphic novel like beyond the familiarity that an audience may have do you feel like writers actually can Tell stories better than screenwriters. Well, I think I think it's uh, you know it's very lonely being a screenwriter. It's mm -hmm. very lonely to try to create something on your own. So if someone has done some of the heavy lifting for you, uh -huh. you know, like you know <laughs> right. Lawrence Hill and David Cherry, and it did some great heavy lifting for me mm -hmm. in terms of um, in, in, you know in terms of their novels. So it, it for me it helps. Is there pressure though? Because I think we've all watched, we've all read these great books, and then mm -hmm. anticipated the movie. Mm -hmm. You watch the movie, you like meh. <laughs> is there yes. a pressure for you to translate that into film? Absolutely. The, you know, um, the, there's a fan base uh, f f you know, for that novel, and they have no problems coming up to you and saying, <laughs> don't mess it up. <laughs> 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 so, yes, indeed, there's a lot of pressure. Mm. How do the rest of you feel about, you know, books being turned into movies? I always love looking every year when it's January, I look at what IP or intellectual property, what books are about to become public domain, mm. and then wait for the flood mm. of film adaptations, because that's mm -hmm. such a part of the industry of Explain what Explain that we... to us, like when they become public domain, people Yeah, can... so if something becomes public domain, you don't have to pay for the rights. Right. So that's at, right. at some point, the Book of Negroes will become public domain. That's right. and it's, it's copyright has expired. Yeah, yeah it's usually, yeah. it depends on the country, but it could be 50 or 75 years after the author's death. Mm -hmm. um, now, it might not necessarily go to public domain. It, there's options to renew it, but certain titles at some point, Alice in Wonderland became public yeah. domain. Yeah, um, Frankenstein. Actually, Frankenstein's Spence. a great That's example. Right. Winnie the Pooh. Um, Winnie the the reason we have Nosferatu in the yes. silent era is because Bram Stoker's estate wouldn't give copyright to Murnau, and he had to change the name of Dracula because there was a point where that was under copyright. So there's always a, a moment in January where certain, depending on what year it is, Mm -hmm. certain works become in the public domain and then you see a rush of producers all try and sometimes years before trying to anticipate Disney did this all the time with when is Pinocchio going to be public domain yeah. when is you know mm -hmm. it's why yeah. we had fairy tales for Disney films yeah. and I always think that's so interesting with because then you don't really have to be kind to the author it really is now a work in the public right. and so you can do anything you want with it. Mm -hmm. Tom? Well, I, you know, I think in the case of Brother and Book of Negroes, which are both very, very good books, I think 
books that are, are kind of pulp fiction really translate well into films. Uh, I think The Godfather is not a great read, but it's a great movie. So what, what do you, what's the X factor then? Well, I, I think that when some, I think a, a great literary piece of work uh, uh, has that in it. It has, uh, you know, the, the, the words and, and your, it captures you in a different way so that when you translate it to film, it, uh, you, you may want to have that expectation to feel the same. So I always try to keep my uh, anticipation or my feelings about the book separate from when I'm watching the film and realize this is a different, this is a different avenue to, to uh, hear this story. Um, Jaws is another book that is, in my opinion, kind of unreadable. I read it when I was a kid, <laughs> but a, a great It's kind film. of racy, Jaws. Right? I, I know, when I, you, I know what scene I know. We, all, we had that ear corner. <laughs> Safe space. Yes, uh, <laughs> Safe space, yes. Um, but it's not a great book. It makes for a great film. Now, um, To Kill a Mockingbird is a great, I think, is a great book that made a great film. Now, I don't know what magic happened mm. to trans. I don't know what, ma you know, it's what magic you put into making Brother into such a great film, you know, because it is a great book. And I would say uh, another Canadian feature, Scarborough, mm. uh, that I saw, and I Catherine just loved, is, yeah. loved that movie. Um, and so I, I ran out and bought the book mm. and uh, loved the book. Mm. So um, it, it, you know, it's I don't rare. know what your question is, it's but I, I, I answered it. <laughs> <laughs> there are films that exist of uh, James Joyce's Ulysses and Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past. Nobody watches them. Nobody remembers them because <laughs> those are very complex books where they exist because of how those writers use language. And a filmmaker has to find a completely different vocabulary because mm -hmm. they're, they're, it's not words, it's, it's images and sounds that filmmakers are working with. And, and sometimes it, it works out. I think Brother's a great example of that. And there are a few others, but for the most part, you're right. Like books that are that are just plot driven, that filmmakers that c can then make visual, like Psycho, or there are many mm -hmm. others. Uh, Jaws is another good one. The Exorcist. That's the, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. when you actually get them becoming cinema. Yeah. Yeah. I love um, I love when a book is called unfilmable and a filmmaker takes <laughs> on that challenge. Like one of my favorite films is Orlando yeah. mm. by Sally Potter, and that was always for a generation an unfilmable book. Because how do you have an actor play both male and female and go from the 1600s to the future? And she did it somehow mm -hmm. because she understood Virginia Woolf's text, and she's a brilliant filmmaker, and she got to the heart of that book, and nothing else mattered. And that's really exciting. Well, you know, um, Clement, uh, Tom asked, he doesn't, how did you do it? Because <laughs> Scarborough, um, Brother was a great book. Right. And uh, as I mentioned in our first conversation, just the first few frames takes you back into that book in a way that uh, I didn't think was possible. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's you know, it's also very personal. It, it, it comes from a personal place. Mm -hmm. When I read that book, it just spoke to me on a visceral level. So I knew it would be easy for me to translate it in some ways. Um, and then, you know, then it's craft. It's like, how do I create an opening that will hook you? How do I create that sense of suspense, you know, using all the tools of, of uh, cinema to make sure that I, I, I hook the audience and keep them going until the very end? Well, you said that it's very personal, but then how do we tell uh, st true stories creatively, uh, but truthfully? Hmm. You know, at the festival, uh, we've seen an evolution, and I'd say in the last decade or so, where there are so many movies you can tell even before they um, before they get to the end of them sometimes, that uh, there is a kind of an arc of a based on a true story movie, right? And there's lots of them, and they always, nearly always end with footage of the real person or <laughs> photographs of the real Go person and titles will say, this person did, went on to do this and this. And, and it becomes a little bit formulaic as well. It's a sort of a genre uh, also. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they work, and we're seeing so many of them, because they're inspiring. They're powerful stories, and the fact that they that a, a real person went through whatever journey the film is showing us or endured whatever the, the film is showing us, that somehow makes them more uh, emotionally powerful for audences. But do directors get more creative license? Because sometimes when the dialogue, I'm like, is that really what 
they said. Or did <laughs> well, the dialogue has got to be all invented. Right. Yeah, right? yeah. But, but the, I think the arc of the story, the fact that somebody set out on a journey, accomplished something that is hard to accomplish, that we've seen so many versions of that. Mm -hmm. And they're often the ones that win awards as well. Yeah. You know, based on a true story, mm -hmm. genre is very popular with the Oscars. Yeah, yeah. And biopic is probably one of the hardest genres to do. Mm. Because, we, you know, we're all like familiar with the biopic genre, which is you see them as a child, they usually get some kind of trauma. <laughs> right? We're drawn to trauma. And then, yeah. and then, you then to, and, and yeah. then, you, and then they, 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 we see the rise. Mm -hmm. And there might be some drug, you know, mm -hmm. some drug addiction there, here and there. Some adversity. Some adversity. Yeah. And then they, you know, they have to pick themselves up and they try and put the end. I mean, there's a kind of arc to that story. And um, the most interesting biopics for me are, you know, somehow changed that. I think uh, Todd Haynes did did one um, on... Uh, uh, Bob Dylan. Uh, Bob, um, yeah. Bob Dylan, yeah, which is right. genius. Yeah. It's, it's a genius. Yeah. Genius. Yeah. Yeah, because he, he just... He, he, he got a bunch of actors to play Bob Dylan, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Including a woman. Including mm -hmm. a woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. He also did one on Karen Carpenter with Barbie dolls. That's right. Mm -hmm. Which cannot be seen. <laughs> cannot be seen because of copyright. That's right. So, yeah, yeah one of the best biopics ever made. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I avoid bi biopics because I, I think the only time they work is when the director gets to take creative uh, 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 stance. And I think the, the Bob Dylan film, the Todd Haynes film, is, is ex I was actually going to bring that one up because that's a prime example for me. The other one is a Canadian one about Chet Baker, uh, which is completely fabricated. Uh, born to, with the blues or born to blues? Uh, or bo uh, born, born to, to be, be blue. blue. Yeah. Yeah. Something. Yeah. There's Hawk, born yeah. in blue. Ethan Hawke. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I saw that movie and I was captivated. And someone said, "Yeah, well, you know, there's not a lick of truth in there." And I went, "Fine," because I got the <laughs> I got the idea of who Chet sure. Baker was, yeah. and I got the sense of because being an artist is is about interpreting reality, mm -hmm. you know, interpretation. And I, uh, if you get the essence of the story and the essence of the person, mm -hmm. and you put it in a story that didn't quite exist, but it represents them perfectly. Yeah, you could say that, that Citizen Kane is a biopic. Mm -hmm. yes. could. We're going to talk sorry. about Citizen Kane, but I, I really don't want this to end. Okay. I, I'm feeling sad <laughs> that we're actually heading into our last final conversation tomorrow just watching how your minds all work like <laughs> it's just like it's been amazing um so our final conversation we'll talk about a movie canon which mm. movies should you have in your canon and how should people pick them subjective objective and that's going to be tomorrow thanks again thank you thank you our guests all this week are Director, producer, and writer Clement Virgo, whose most recent film, Brother, won the Canadian Screen Award for Best Picture. Cameron Bailey, CEO of the Toronto International Film Festival. Alicia Fletcher, producer of Originals and Curatorial Advancement at Hollywood Suite. And film critic Tom Ernst, formerly host here of Saturday Night at the Movies and author of The Wild Boy of Wobbamick. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.